Tonight marks somewhat of a milestone for us this year. You may recall that we have engaged in a, a thematic series all year long on Sunday nights. Now, the subject matter has changed with the changing of each month, but for the entirety of this year, with the exception of June, we have tailored our Sunday nights to subjects that relate to the home. Back in January, we focused on Christ-likeness in the home with the, the, the mindset that if we want our homes to be all that God intends, then Christ has to be at the center of them. In February, we focused on intimacy in the home. In March, we talked about threats to the home. In April, we focused on healing in the home. May brought us to the conversation of forgiveness in the home. In July, we turned our attention to roles in the home. And in August, balance in the home. September, we focused on communication in the home. And just last month, we wrapped up our emphasis on discipline in the home. See, tonight is a milestone because we come to our last subject matter focus for this Sunday night emphasis on the home. December, we're not going to continue this emphasis because December gets a little choppy. We've got a special event Sunday uh, in which we'll have an early afternoon service on December 8th because that is our homecoming 50th anniversary. Okay, I'm going to, you know, you're going to get used to hearing about it. And then it's also, you know, December is filled with this holiday travel, and it kind of makes it complicated to keep everybody consistently on a topic. So tonight marks the beginning of our last monthly focus on the home. So what will be our final subject? Well, to set us up for that, let me share some data with you that, that I recently came across. According to an article dated October 24th, 2024 on marriage.com, one of the seven prime causes of conflict in marriage is inability to manage marriage finances. And according to an article published on October 17th of 2024 on Forbes.com, Financial stress is the sixth leading cause of divorce in the United States, accounting for 24% of all divorces. Needless to say, financial matters matter in the home. So for the month of November, we're going to attempt to address money and finances by focusing on contentment in the home. And as we have done every month with this focus, we're going to study about contentment tonight. Next Sunday night, we're going to sing and read about contentment from God's Word. On the third Sunday night of this month, we're going to apply some basic principles related to contentment in the home. And finally, on the last Sunday of this month, we're going to pray about contentment and issue a call to action related to it. But why did we choose to call this month's focus contentment in the home? Why not just call it finances in the home or stewardship in the home or money in the home? Well, we chose the title contentment in the home because that's one of the core biblical teachings related to money in the Bible. So if you've got your Bibles, know this, the PowerPoint is over. If you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, because tonight we're just going to focus in on a handful of passages as we study what the Bible has to say about contentment. But the first thing I want you to notice appears in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, because it is there that Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He then goes on to say, For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, 
into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 says that contentment is something to be added to godliness. That contentment is something that we're supposed to equip ourselves with. And he sets it in contrast to the love of money. So contentment is to be pursued. The love of money is to be abstained from. There's another passage I want you to notice as we get started with this study of contentment. I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 13 with me. And some of our young people should recognize this passage because just about, oh, less than, less than an hour ago, they sang about this. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, we are instructed by the author of Hebrews to be content with what you have. But that comes on the heels of another instruction, which was to keep your life free from love of money. Do you see the comparison? Contentment is always set in contrast to love of money. Now let's be honest. I think every one of us in here would love to have more money. We wouldn't be opposed to being gifted with more money. But what Scripture says is that we need to have the proper attitude towards money. And that proper attitude is always set in the context of contentment. And so as we enter this last month of our home study, we feel it's important for us to grasp contentment. Because so many problems and difficulties and hurdles and conflicts that arise in marriages and in the context of the home have a lot to do with money. If we want to have the homes that God intends for us to have, then we need to have the right attitude towards money. But what exactly is contentment? Contentment is quite simply a state of satisfaction. In the context of our study, contentment is specifically a state of satisfaction when it comes to money and possessions and wealth. It's the opposite of the attitude depicted by the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. I encourage you to turn over there to Luke chapter 12, particularly beginning in verse 13, because Jesus is going to launch into a parable that shows us what contentment is not. Now, what you need to know when you get to Luke chapter 12 and verse 13 is that there is, there is a context to the parable. The context is that some bystander asks Jesus to address an inheritance issue between him and his sibling. Someone at random speaks to Jesus and says, hey, Will you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? There's a financial conflict in that family. And this guy is asking Jesus to weigh in on it. And Jesus' initial response is, what do I have to do with that? That's got nothing to do with me. He says this in verse 15 of Luke 12, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus is essentially saying, that's not as big of a deal as you think it is. What's more important is that you don't get caught up in coveting, that you don't fall in love with money. And then he launches into this parable that begins actually at about verse 16. He says, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. 
And there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And when you hear that parable, it is apparent that the rich fool was not content. He was blessed so much that he couldn't fit all of his harvest in his barns. And in the face of such blessings, he didn't think, I have so much that I can't even begin to use all of it, so why don't don't I give it to some people who are in need? Why don't I use it to expand the borders of God's kingdom? No, instead he thought, I need to build bigger barns. I need to store, I need to to have places to store the excess of what I have, not just what I need. He had more than enough on which to live, but instead of finding ways to use his excess for the glory of God, he chose to hoard it. Now, realize this, the text, Jesus in, the, in, the, in his explanation and in his application and in his instruction here does not condemn this man for tax evasion or money laundering or insider trading or any of those financial sins that we think of. His critique really is on the fact that this guy was never satisfied, never content with what he had, so he just kept accumulating for himself, not giving any consideration of God's kingdom or God's will. That's a failure to be content. What we need to realize is that our financial frustrations are often not an income problem, but an insatiability problem, as one preacher pointed out. That means that the solution to our problem is not for us to acquire more, but for us to desire less. Now think about that. We often think the way that our financial difficulties get resolved is if we can get more money. But sometimes, and maybe most times, our financial problems could be resolved by us simply wanting less stuff or wanting to spend less money. Any of you who have ever gone through the Financial Peace University have seen that enacted in that financial debt reduction plan. The idea is to just spend less money, to budget in such a way, and to stop using credit to attain things. And it all comes down to just spending less. This willingness to desire less is what the Bible calls contentment. And the truth is that it can be learned. I think we look at contentment and assume that I'm either a content person or I'm not. Just like we assume I'm a saver or I'm a spender. I'm content or I'm not. I can't fix it. I can't change it. I can't do anything about it. But the Bible declares that contentment is something you learn. So turn with me to the book of Philippians, to chapter 4. We'll spend a little bit of time here. Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, you have the conclusion of Paul's letter to this church in Philippi. One of the things this church has done is they have sent financial support to Paul during his imprisonment. And he's about to talk about that gift and how beneficial it was, how he appreciated it. But before he addresses the gift that he received from the Philippians, 
He said this, starting in verse 11 of Philippians chapter 4. He said, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Notice the emphasis of learning. Paul wasn't born with a content heart. He didn't inherit a content heart. He wasn't gifted a content heart. He learned to have a content heart. The point is that contentment is the result of adopting a new way of thinking. And that new way of thinking is identified by Paul in the subsequent verses of Philippians chapter 4. I want you now to skip ahead. Go down to verse 19 of this chapter and look at the bold declaration Paul made about God in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. To his Philippian audience, he said, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply every need of yours. Now, I find it very interesting that this bold declaration about God supplying needs is stated shortly after Paul wrote about learning contentment. The reason that stands out to me is because I think it's very intentional on Paul's part to connect contentment with God's provision. But here's what we have to realize. The bold declaration Paul makes here is about needs, not wants. Because there's an extremely big difference between a need and a want. A need is something on which survival depends. A want is something on which satisfaction depends. And contentment, which is a learned trait, occurs when one's survival and satisfaction are one and the same thing. What I mean is that the contented heart is one that has so aligned itself with the will of God that it wants nothing more than for the will of God to be done. And as a result, the satisfaction of that individual's heart is found in simply having its needs met. Because what's most important to it is that the will of God abounds. With that understanding of contentment, Let's hold our spot here in Philippians chapter 4, but let's journey back to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is going to give us some anti-worrying teaching in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6. Pay attention to what Jesus says there, particularly in verse 31 through 33. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 31, Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows, knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, I want you to pay attention to what Jesus says here. First off, Jesus said that the Gentiles, the Gentiles seek after needs like food and water and clothing. When he says Gentiles here, what he means is pagans or unbelievers. People outside of Christianity, people not following God, people who have not become disciples. Their focus, what they seek, are things like food, water, clothing. Despite the fact that God is fully aware they need them. Jesus then goes on to instruct Christians to be different. He instructs us not to seek our needs first, 
but to seek God's will first. To seek first His kingdom and His righteousness because if you seek that first, He'll make sure the needs are covered. That's what Jesus is saying here. You see, Jesus is saying that God's promise to take care of our needs must be preceded by our willingness to prioritize His kingdom and His righteousness. Because if you do that, then you'll discover that you don't have nearly as many needs as you thought. If God's will is the priority of your life, then all your wants and all your desires will be expunged. And what will be left are your true needs. And God promises to supply all of those. And when you adopt the mentality that God is my priority, and you have the faith that He's going to supply your needs, then you know what you find? More correctly, you know what you learn? You learn contentment. See, a God-honoring mindset towards finances is one that has learned to be content with what they have because they have what really matters. They have a relationship with the Father whose promises of provision and protection are unchanging and unfailing. That means that commitment, excuse me, that means that contentment is a byproduct of faith. You cannot learn contentment until you've learned to trust God. See, a lack of contentment is usually not an indicator that we're barely getting by or that we're under resourced or that we're giving away too much. A lack of contentment is usually an indicator that we're trusting too little. See, if you, since the Garden of Eden, mankind has struggled with the same question. Can we trust God? I mean, think about it. When the serpent deceived Adam and Eve, they were left with this question in their minds. Can we trust what God told us about that tree? Can we trust that God's not holding out on us when it comes to knowledge? Can we trust God? We still battle that question today, and in some cases, it touches on our finances. So here we are. God has promised to meet our needs. Can we trust that? Can we trust God? that God is going to supply our needs. For some of us, there's a little voice in the back of our minds that's always saying, I don't know if God will come through, so I better take care of it myself. I don't know if God's going to come through. So I I better not put anything in the collection plate because I might need it for me. I I don't know if God's going to come through. So I better store up a little bit more here while I can. I, I, I don't know if God's going to come through. So I might as well... Go get it for myself. Listen, I'm not trying to sit here and proclaim that you don't work hard, that you don't save, that you don't prepare. Those principles do exist in Scripture. Laziness is condemned in Scripture. Industriousness is promoted in Scripture. Preparation is promoted in Scripture. I'm not saying you don't do those things. What I am saying is that it's way more important to trust in God than it is to trust in yourself. Contentment 
Contentment is the mindset that no matter what happens tomorrow, God's going to take care of me. It's believing what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 that God will supply every need. And do you realize who Paul's writing to when he says that? If you, if you turn back to that Philippians chapter 4 passage, he's writing to people, to Christians, to fellow believers who have just sacrificed their own finances, their own wealth, their own possessions to supply him with needs while he's in prison. Paul's a prisoner. He has no income. He has no way to survive. This isn't like American prison where you have where you can earn your degree. Where you have that free time outside to work out and exercise, where you have free health care. It's not like that. To a large degree, while Paul's in prison, he is dependent on the support of people outside prison. And these people are sacrificing so that he's taken care of. Paul lived it. Paul lived this trust that God would supply his needs. Now, you might be here tonight thinking, I can't say that God has supplied all my needs. Let me give you a couple of things to think about. And I have to be honest I've adopted these from a fellow preacher, so they're not necessarily original to me. And adopted is my nice way of saying I stole them. Maybe the problem is, as one preacher said, you're not asking God to meet your needs. You're asking Him to meet your greeds. See, Philippians 4.19 says God will supply every need of yours, not every want or every desire. Oftentimes we sit back and wonder why God's not supplying us with that new truck. Or God's not supplying us with that new PlayStation 5. Or God's not supplying us with that new name brand purse. I don't know. I'm, I'm not familiar with that enough to give you a brand. Are those needs or are they wants? I mean, I'm still waiting on God to supply me with season tickets to the Hawks. It hasn't come yet. Because that's not a need. We must admit some of the things we petition God for are not born out of need, but instead are born out of selfish interest. That's why James said this in James chapter 4 and verse 3. He said, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. To spend it on your passions. So it may be that you're not experiencing the promise of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 because you're asking for things that you have incorrectly identified as needs when they're really just wants or desires. But if you don't think that God has met all your needs, Maybe the problem is that you haven't been storing up treasure in heaven. You know, the promise of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, as well as the promise of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, is for people who have given their lives to the Lord. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and look at verses 14 through 18. Because the promise of verse 19 is for people who live by verse 14 through 18. It's here that Paul writes about the gift he received. He said, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. 
Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. What Paul is saying is that you Philippians, you're prioritizing his kingdom and his righteousness. What he's saying is that you're invested in the kingdom. You're putting God first. You're seeking the right things. If you're not experiencing God's abundant supply, could it be because you're not seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness, as Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says? Because when Paul speaks to the Philippians and says that my God will supply every need of yours, he's speaking to people who have been prioritizing the Lord in their lives. Contentment is a complicated subject because to some degree it's illogical. To some degree it doesn't make sense to trust in the Lord to supply your needs. To some degree it just seems weird to be content with what you have. But if we can adopt a content mentality, we can rid our homes of the problems and the burdens and the sins that come with a love of money. And so I want to close by telling you about a guy named Robert Roger Babson. He was an economist, an American economist, in the first half of the 20th century. And he went down to South America, and according to the story, he met with the uh, president of Argentina. And that president asked him a question. Knowing that he's a financial guy and somewhat of a history buff, he asked, will you please tell me why it is that South America, with her unlimited resources and having been settled earlier than North America, has nevertheless made much slower progress in civilization and material prosperity? Mr. Babson didn't know quite how to answer that, so he kind of threw the question back at that president and said, Mr. President, you evidently have studied this question yourself, and I would be interested to know your answer to it. And that president replied, saying that he thought the explanation lay in the fact that South America was settled by Spaniards who came seeking gold, while North America was settled by pilgrims who came seeking faith. You see, contentment is really about what you're seeking. That's what contentment is all about. So that tonight, as we launch into a month where contentment will be our focus, the real question is, is wealth and prosperity and accumulation what you seek most? Or is it the kingdom of God and His righteousness? If it's not the latter, you might just be missing out on the blessings that God intends to pour out on you. And if it's not the latter, maybe something needs to change tonight. If you have any need to respond to the invitation, we extend it this evening and we invite you to come to the front row while together we stand.